Previously, we examined the history of the Jewish tribes in the city of Medina and around the city of Medina. The Prophet ﷺ, when he arrived the city of Medina, he signed on a historic document or constitution with the Jewish tribes in the area. He made an agreement, a charter between the Muslims of Medina and the Jewish tribes in that area. This is a very historic document. Scholars of legal studies, constitutional scholars have examined this amazing charter of Medina, the constitution of Medina. And for the Prophet ﷺ to bring that in 7th century Arabia was something unprecedented. We will examine some tenets and some parts of this important charter and constitution. It really is the greatest documentary agreement in history. Initially, the Prophet ﷺ, he made this document with eight tribes, we'll examine them later, in the city of Medina. These tribes came from the Aus and Khazraj. So it seems that historically, they were Arabs who converted to Judaism and they became Jewish tribes because of the influence of other tribes. Initially, the three main Jewish tribes which are they? We stated them last week. The main three Jewish tribes around the city of Medina were who? Bani Nadir, Bani Qaynaqa, Bani Quraidah. These three. Initially, they did not sign the document with the Prophet. Later, the Prophet ﷺ made an agreement with them and he had their representative sign it. So, this document that we're going to study now is a document that he made with eight Jewish tribes from the Aus and the Khazraj. So these were Arab Jews whom the Prophet ﷺ made the agreement with. Then later the other tribes, they made an agreement with the Prophet. So all the Aus and Khazraj were Jewish? No, not all the Aus and Khazraj were Jewish. They were Mushrikeen, most of them. However, some of them had converted to Judaism and they were eight tribes. Initially, when the Prophet ﷺ signs this document, he doesn't sign it with the three main Jewish tribes who are Bani Quraidha, Bani Nadir, and Bani Qaynaqa. He initially signs it with these eight tribes who were originally from the Aus and the Khazraj. So it seems that initially they were pagan Arabs who converted to Judaism. The Prophet makes an agreement with them. Later, the other Jews follow, the other main Jewish tribes, they follow and they sign a document with the Prophet ﷺ. So this is how the Prophet ﷺ starts the document. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. This is the agreement which has been concluded by Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, between the Muslims of Quraysh, and of Yathrib and the members of the Jewish tribes. So the Prophet explicitly states in the beginning and the opening of the document what this document is and who are the two parties involved. So basically the Muslims from Quraysh, meaning the Muhajireen, because they had come from Mecca, they're from Quraysh, and the people of Yathrib the, who are the Ansar. They are the ones who are making an agreement with the people of the book. We can divide this document into four parts. The first part has many, many items. In fact, if you examine the document, it has about 57 clauses. We're not going to examine all of them, but I would highly recommend that you examine these clauses and study them. They're very interesting. We're going to go over some of these clauses. Yes. Was each of the four parts say something differently? Like each one had its own name? No, this is when we analyze it, we see it has four parts. But basically there is no name for these parts. We can divide them into four categories. When we examine what the Prophet is discussing, 
if we organize them according to the main theme in that part, we can have four parts, but it's one document. So in the first part of that document, the first clause states the following, the signatories to the agreement form one nation. And the matter of blood money, then we'll examine what that means. Look at that first clause, the signatories of this agreement form one nation. This was unprecedented in the Arabian Peninsula because the Arabian Peninsula was based on tribalism. You belong to your tribe, you're united with your tribe. But for the Prophet ﷺ to gather so many different people, Muhajirin and the Ansar, they themselves come from tens of tribes. Then now you have the people of the book, the Jews, and to include them in one ummah, in one nation, this was something unprecedented. No one had done that in Arabia. In fact, people found that awkward. What's uniting us here? We don't belong to the same tribe. We're not relatives. But the Prophet did the unprecedented. And really when you examine this clause, he was forming a nation. You know, today when we look at countries, right? We see countries are based on what? On having one nation. You could belong to different races, but that land considers you one. This is something the Prophet ﷺ achieved 14 centuries ago. Yes, brother. So it was not tribal and not religious at the same time, this one nation included the Jews. So it was not tribal for sure. As for the religion, it was based on monotheism. What defined this one ummah is believing in God not being a pagan because the Prophet ﷺ does not include the mushrikeen, the pagans in this document. So this is a document that gathers the believers in the one God in one nation. And that's beautiful, this was something really unprecedented. Then after that, the clause states in the matter of blood money, the Quraysh Muhajirs are allowed to follow their old custom. Basically the people of Mecca, had an old custom when it came to blood money. When somebody is killed, what is the blood money, the diya that has to be paid? Someone is taken as a captive and so on and so forth. There are aspects of Arab culture that the religion of Islam recognized. Because the religion of Islam found it based on justice. You know, blood money is based on justice because you have to compensate the family. That compensation is something that Islam finds justified. Therefore, this constitution recognizes this. Yes, Islam did reject a lot of elements in the Arabic culture that it found problematic, but if there was something good, something reasonable, something that made sense, the religion of Islam did recognize it. And so this is mentioned in the first clause. Then in later clauses, the Prophet ﷺ states, Muslims should support the poor and needy per persons and should help a believer in the matter of heavy expenses to be incurred by him on account of payment of blood money or for the release of a captive. If a Muslim has to play, pay blood money or anything else and they're stuck, this document calls on the believers to help one another. Someone doesn't have that cash and they're stuck, they're held as a captive, they need to pay some blood money, other believers are required to come and support them. In a later clause, the Prophet ﷺ writes the following, he dictates the following, pious Muslims should unite against a person who rebels or commits cruelty and injustice even though the offender is the son of one of them. Why is this important in 7th century Arabia? They were tribal, so if a member of your tribe commits a crime, are there consequences? Yep. If they commit a crime against another tribe? Yep. If a member of my tribe in 7th century Arabia commits a crime against another tribe, kills an innocent person, loots them, raids them, does the tribe do anything about it? No. no. There are no consequences. If your aggression 
is aimed at another tribe, at another people, at another race, there were no consequences. The Prophet ﷺ changes that with this constitution. The Prophet says no, even if he's your son, even if he's your relative, he's part of your tribe, if he commits a crime, we have to stand united in, in his face. This was initially difficult for them to accept, <laughs> unprecedented. I'm gonna go against my own son if he violated another tribe? That was unheard of. But the Prophet ﷺ made this an important clause in this constitution. Then in a following clause, the Prophet ﷺ gives protection to those Jews who become Muslim so that there aren't any repercussions. Because some people from the Jewish tribes, they were interested in Islam, but they feared the backlash that they would face from the Jewish tribes. How dare you embrace the religion of Islam? So the Prophet makes it very clear that when it comes to this issue, they should be given the freedom. So he states everyone from amongst the Jews who follows us and embraces Islam shall be entitled to our help and assistance and there will be no difference between him and other Muslims. The second part of this clause makes it clear to Muslims that when a convert or a revert as we say, when they join the religion of Islam, do not discriminate against them and see them as outsiders. You know this problem exists until today? When someone converts to the religion of Islam, we get very happy, especially if they're doing the shahada and we pass the clips, right? But then you know after that, we don't have a support system for them. In fact, we don't care about them. In fact, we become suspicious of them. We don't really welcome them like one of our own. But in this clause, the Prophet ﷺ is dictating to the Muslims that if someone from a Jewish tribe converts and becomes a Muslim, welcome them and treat them like your own sons, like your own family members, like your own tribe members. And this was a very important step that the Prophet ﷺ took to give a support system to those who convert to the religion of Islam because it's not easy. When you convert, oftentimes you lose everything. You lose your network of friends, your family, sometimes your property. So the Prophet is teaching us, welcome them, embrace them. And this very problem, we still struggle with it in our communities everywhere in the world. Yes. See, the, the agreement is between the Jews and the Muslims. So first of all, the Prophet is giving them their rights. If someone wants to convert and become a Muslim, let him. Give them that free choice. Secondly, you Muslims, when you see a Jewish person convert, welcome them. Treat them as if one of, they're one of you. Don't treat them as outsiders and be suspicious of them. Welcome them, embrace them. So yes, the Prophet is specifically here talking about the Jews because the document is with the Jews. Obviously the spirit of this clause would apply to every non-Muslim who embraces the religion of Islam. Is that document still available? That document, yes, it's still available. Um, we have historians like Ibn Ishaq, they have captured these excerpts in Arabic. The original document that the Prophet signed on, no, that got lost in history. But we have historians like Ibn Ishaq who had access to earlier sources, they narrate this to us, yes. So this was an important clause. Another clause that we find in this document, the Muslims should be united in concluding a peace agreement and no Muslim can conclude peace without consulting another Muslim except on the basis of justice and equality. When you want to go and declare peace, don't do it unilaterally because that's what the tribes would do. They would decide, you know what, let's go and make peace with so-and-so pagan tribe and then they surprise everyone else and they change the whole equation and then you, know, you never know what's next, there's a conspiracy. In this document, the Prophet is stating if you want to make peace with any side, it has to be by the majority. You have to consult other Muslims. If the Muslims agree and they feel this is in their interest, then you go and conclude a peace agreement. But don't do it the tribal way, suddenly your tribe, your family decides, hey, let's go make peace with the mushriks of Quraysh. And then you endanger other Muslims because sometimes that would be a way for the enemy to take advantage of you and exploit you. They would befriend one of your tribes and then they steal your secrets and then they attack you. 
So if there is a peace agreement, all Muslims must be included in it. You can't secretly go and do a peace agreement because that will, you know, um, expose us to danger.